All right. In the interest of time, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, thanks to all of you for taking time out of your day to join us and talk about your student loans. Just a few housekeeping notes before we proceed. This workshop is being recorded and everyone will receive a copy of this recording uh, in addition to uh, other informational materials and resources uh, that I've talked about here today. So if you have to step away at any time or lose track of what's going on, not to worry. Again, you'll receive a copy of everything that you see and hear tonight. Uh, that being said, if you do have any questions as I'm going through the presentation, I encourage you to put them in the Q&A. We have a smaller group tonight, which is good for you all because it hopefully means that I will get to answer any and all questions that you may have. Uh, and I usually end up staying on after the hour uh, to make sure that everyone's questions are answered. Um, so if I don't get to it you know, throughout the presentation, uh, I promise I will try to get to all of those questions at the end. Uh, and if you need to enable closed captioning or live transcription during the webinar, uh, I'm going to be posting a link in the chat with instructions on how to enable this feature on Zoom. So just a quick look at the agenda we're going to cover here. Uh, I'm first going to do some brief introductions uh, of myself, uh, who we are here at Savvy, and our uh, relationship and partnership with Union Plus and all of the union members. Uh, and then we're going to dive into really the meat of the presentation, which is around student loan basics. You can kind of think of this like student loans 101, the most important concepts you should understand as a student loan borrower. So this includes things like the different types of student loans, uh, your student loan servicers, uh, programs like public service loan forgiveness or PSLF and income-driven repayment plans or IDR plans. These can be a powerful way to help lower your monthly payment. We're also gonna talk about some of the more recent and major policy updates. A lot has been going on uh, in the world of student loans. It feels like there's always something going on, uh, but I'm gonna really try to capture the most important things you should be aware of at this point in time and any action you may need to take. And then we're going to wrap things up by uh, me walking you through how to get started with Savvy, this amazing tool and resource that you all now have at your disposal that can hopefully help you to navigate your way uh, through these programs and reach uh, some type of finish line around your student loan debt. So my name is Lindsay Clark. I'm the chief borrower advocate here at Savvy. I have been at Savvy since its founding. Uh, I'm a student loan borrower myself. I have a little over $200,000 in student loan debt. Uh, I say that because one, it might make some of you feel better about your own situations, in which case mission accomplished. Uh, but two, because being a borrower really impacts how I communicate about these topics. I know firsthand how overwhelming and complicated this system can be. I wasn't always a student loan expert. And so my goal here tonight is to try and articulate these things in a way that is easy to digest, but is going to leave you feeling better and more empowered than when you arrived. Um, again, because these are, are complicated things. Uh, you might be a financial expert. You might have everything else together, have a PhD, who knows? But when it comes to student loans, that's sort of like the great equalizer. Uh, so you are absolutely not alone. You're here with fellow union members who also have student loan debt, as well as 47 million Americans. Uh, and again, this is something that we're going to tackle together over the next hour. Now, I work for a company called Savvy. Savvy is a social impact technology startup based in Washington, D.C., we were founded by student loan experts and advocates who've been fighting on behalf of the borrower for more than a decade. Uh, and we saw how difficult it was for borrowers to navigate some of these federal programs like public service loan forgiveness and decided to do something about it. So we developed Savvy as a technology platform and a human service to help borrowers like you and like me not only better understand our student loans, but to successfully navigate from start to finish around these programs. But along the way, our goal is to make the experience of being a student loan borrower a better one, because I think we can all agree it's not great. Uh, and we try to do that by identifying as much additional savings as possible on a monthly basis through things like income-driven repayment plans. 
At Savvy, we like to think that borrowers, not their loans, are our top priority. There are a lot of entities and companies in this space that make money off of servicing your debt. And at Savvy, our goal is to service you, the borrower. And in that sense, we really act as your advocate in many, many ways, which you'll come to learn over the next uh, hour or so. Which brings us to why we're here tonight, uh, because we have partnered with Union Plus to provide all of you and all of the unions as part of Union Plus with access to Savvy as an exclusive student loan benefit. So not just anyone can access Savvy, we provide it through these partnerships and we, and we work with uh, hundreds of amazing organizations uh, and companies across the country, uh, many, many unions, NEA, SEIU, uh, you know, long time for the last five years or so uh, to provide their members with access to uh, this benefit because we believe that's the best way to reach borrowers is where they are and through that trusted messenger. Uh, and so we're really excited to be able to offer this to you all uh, and not just you, but your family members as well. If there's one thing I know firsthand, or as I'd like to say, student debt can run in families. I have student debt, my brother does, my dad does, even my grandfather does, who was a co-signer on some of my loans. So uh, this benefit is something that you will not only be able to access, but any of your family members who have student loan debt as well. All right, so with intros out of the way, let's dive right in and we're gonna talk through some of the most important basics around your federal student loans. So again, some of these topics are going to include student loan servicers, what are they and what role do they play with your student loans? the different types of federal student loans. This one is really important, something I was certainly unaware of as a borrower early on, because the type of federal student loan that you have is going to impact your eligibility for certain repayment and forgiveness programs. And you may need to take corrective action in order to make it eligible. So we'll talk more on that in a bit. We're also gonna talk about income-driven repayment plans. What are they and how could they potentially lower your monthly payment? And we're going to wrap it up by talking about public service loan forgiveness or PSLF. This is one of the biggest and longest standing forgiveness programs out there that has remained unchallenged in the courts. Uh, it was signed into law in 2007 uh, and it can forgive the remainder of your loan balance after 10 or more years in public service. And I know many of our union members out there qualify for this program based on their employment. So We'll go into more detail on that in just a bit as well. All right, so let's start with student loan servicers. So uh, I put some examples of these companies on your screen right here. Great Lakes, Ed Financial, Aid Vantage, Osla, Nelnet, Mohila. These are essentially companies that are contracted by the Department of Education in the repayment and management of your student loans. So every federal student loan borrower, when they go into repayment, is assigned to one of these companies. And this company is basically in charge of collecting on that debt. Uh, so you'll usually get, you know, an email from them, right, telling you, you know, to set up your online account. This is where you'll be able to log in and see what your monthly payment amount is, set up that auto debit, things like that. All right. So this is sort of the management of those loans on a month to month basis. Now, a couple things. Just to clarify, Savvy, our company, is not a student loan servicer. So we would never take the role of that student loan servicer as it currently stands. You can kind of think of us more like uh, an intermediary, a facilitator, or an advocate on your behalf. So if borrowers are on one side and these student loan servicers are on the other, Savvy is kind of right in the middle. And our goal is really to reduce the friction that many borrowers experience with their student loan servicers. Whether it's they try to apply for a program and never hear back or are rejected, or they can't get a hold of any human person on the phone when they try to call, that's really where we come in. Now, a few things that you should know about these student loan servicing companies. First, it's completely normal for your student loans to move from one company to another. So maybe you started out with uh, Navient and now you have Advantage. That's completely normal. Doesn't mean that your loans were sold. There are no material impacts to your balance, uh, interest rate or anything like that. 
it's just sort of a natural uh, consequence of this student loan system because these companies are on contract with the government. And sometimes those contracts end and aren't renewed. And when that happens, borrowers who are being serviced or managed by one company are moved to another going forward, right? So it's very common for uh, a borrower over the lifetime of their payment to perhaps have two, three, even more student loan servicers, but you don't get a say in the process. So there's no way you can choose one particular servicer over another. This happens uh, outside of your control. But that being said, over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of movement among servicers. And so I just wanna make sure everyone is aware of what servicer they currently have. And you can find that information out. I'm gonna put this in the chat right now. You can find that out by going to studentaid.gov. Studentaid.gov is the official website of the Department of Education. Uh, and you're gonna log in using what's called your federal student aid ID. This is what you created when you took out the loans to begin with. And when you log in, it's gonna show you any and all federal student loans, grants, or aid that you've ever received. And from that dashboard, you will be able to see the servicer you're currently assigned. So if you're unsure, you just wanna double check, it's good to just make sure you know what servicer you have. Once you've confirmed what servicer you have, you also wanna make sure your contact information is fully updated with that servicer, because that's how they're gonna be communicating with you about important things like your due date, your monthly bill, et cetera. Uh, so you wanna make sure that contact info is all up to date. You know, you've selected your communication preferences, you know, whether you wanna go paperless or paper, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, so again, these, these companies, while uh, they can be very frustrating, um, and oftentimes don't provide borrowers with the service that they need uh, or deserve. They are a crucial link in this system uh, that unfortunately can't be avoided. And again, Savvy is here to sort of help you navigate uh, and to act as an advocate on your behalf when and if you run into issues. All right, I don't see any questions coming through on servicers, so we'll keep chugging along here. Okay, now let's talk about the different types of federal student loans. And again, this one is really important because the type of federal student loan you have is going to impact your eligibility for certain repayment and forgiveness programs. Uh, so I'm first gonna talk through the different types of federal student loans in the green columns here. And then I'm gonna touch on private loans at the very end. So let's start on the uh, furthest left-hand side of your screen with direct loans. So the direct loan uh, program is a federal loan program that began around 2010. So if you have a federal student loan that was dispersed from 2010 to present day, there's a very good chance it is a direct loan. Uh, the easiest way to tell if it's a direct loan is it will literally say the word direct or DL, which stands for direct loan in that loan title. Uh, examples include direct subsidized, direct unsubsidized, and direct consolidation loans. Okay. Now, the great thing about direct loans uh, is that they are eligible for all the programs we're going to talk about here tonight, including things like income-driven repayment and public service loan forgiveness. So if you have direct loans, you're good to go and in the clear. Now let's move on to FEL loans, F-F-E-L loans which stands for Federal Family Education Loans. Now, this was simply the federal loan program in existence prior to direct loans. So if you have a federal student loan from before 2010, there's a very good chance it could be a FEL loan. Easiest way to tell if it's a FEL loan is it will literally say FFEL or FFELP. That P just stands for program, but that's a FEL loan in the loan title, all right? Examples include fell subsidized, fell unsubsidized, and even fell consolidation. Now, here's the thing about these fell loans. They are not eligible for all the programs we're going to talk about here tonight, okay? And in order to become eligible, they need to be consolidated. Now, consolidation is a free federal process by which you are basically taking one loan or multiple loans 
and creating what's called a new direct consolidation loan, okay? Doesn't check your credit or anything like that. This, this process is unique to the federal loan system. So I don't want you to confuse it with refinancing, okay? Which you'd refinance at a lower interest rate. This consolidation process is part of the federal student loan system. Um, and for FEL loans, in order to be eligible for programs like public service loan forgiveness, they need to be consolidated. It's sort of a technicality, uh, technical hurdle, you could say, that you need to, uh, to jump over in order to make that loan type eligible, okay? All right, moving on to PLUS loans. So PLUS loans come in two varieties, Parent PLUS loan and Grad PLUS loan. So let's start with Parent PLUS loans. You know, many people think the student debt crisis is a young person's problem, a millennial issue, when in fact the fastest growing demographic of student loan borrowers is actually ages 50 plus, and it's parents taking out loans for their kids. And that's exactly what a Parent PLUS loan is. It's a loan taken out by a parent on behalf of a child, but in that parent's name. That loan might as well be taken out for the parent, okay? It is in that parent's name. It cannot be transferred or moved to the child's name uh, at any point in time, all right? So it is essentially that parent's debt. Now, these parent plus loans, just like the FELL loans I just talked about, require consolidation in order to be eligible for programs like public service loan forgiveness or even income driven repayment. So if you have a parent plus loan and you're interested in those programs, you will need to consolidate that loan in order to make it eligible. And I'm gonna show you later on how Savvy can help you identify your loan type and help you with that consolidation process. But I wanna just make you aware right now of the loan types that would require consolidation, okay? Now, grad plus loans, as the name might imply, are loans taken out by graduate or professional students. Uh, and those loans are eligible as is for those programs. They require no corrective action like a consolidation, okay? So if at this point you're already starting to think that was a lot of acronyms, a lot of information, I'm a little getting a little overwhelmed, uh, you'd be completely right. Uh, and it just goes to show you how complicated this system can be but the really important takeaways are this. One, knowing your loan type, okay? Uh, if it's a direct loan or grab plus loan, you're good to go. If it's a fell loan or a parent plus loan, you may wanna think about consolidating that loan to make them eligible for those programs, okay? So again, this is a concept, most people just think of student loans as maybe federal or private, but there are different types of federal loans and they matter when it comes to your eligibility for these programs. Okay, lastly, I just want to touch on private loans. So of all the student debt out there, you know, 1.74 trillion of it, 90% of it is federal, all right? So only about 10% is private, but many borrowers have a combination of both federal and private loans because they've needed to take out private loans after they've exhausted their federal options, myself included. When it comes to private loans, all right, these are obviously non-federal loans that are issued by a commercial lender, such as a bank, credit union, uh, state agency, or maybe even your school or university, okay? So some examples include Wells Fargo, SoFi, Discover, Chase, things like that. Now, unfortunately, private loans are not eligible for any federal repayment, forgiveness, or relief programs out there. And there is no corrective action that you can take, like a consolidation, to make them eligible. Once they are private, they are private in perpetuity. That being said, if you do have private loans, my best suggestion for you is to reach out to your uh, individual lender to see what options may be available to you as far as repayment goes. Because there's no overarching federal system by which these loans must abide, each lender is going to offer their, you know, their own terms, repayment plans, et cetera. So it's going to differ from lender to lender. Uh, and the best source for that information is going to be your specific lender, right? Okay, before I go on to income-driven repayment, let's see, I saw a couple questions come through. Okay, someone asked if you're able to see and hear participants. Nope, don't worry. Uh, this is a webinar Zoom, so everyone is automatically uh, muted and, and no camera. 
Uh, so, so not to worry, Carla. <laughs> um, okay. Someone else asked about consolidation. Uh, so this person asks, you know, I requested to consolidate my loans two months ago and I've not heard back from them. How long does this process take? You know, whenever I call my servicer Mohila, they tell me to talk to FSA and FSA tells me to talk to Mohila. It's very frustrating. Uh, I totally, I totally understand. So normally consolidation takes about a month to process, but I will say this, the servicers that process these consolidations and in, in working with FSA uh, have been experiencing a lot of delays um, as a result of some of the lawsuits that have come through in the recent months. And we're gonna talk about this in a little bit. Uh, so Sadiqa, what I can suggest is you should be able to see the status of your consolidation through your uh, federal student aid account on studentaid.gov. When you go to the activity section, it should say uh, the, the status of that consolidation if you had submitted it online. Um, and if it's still saying, you know, it's, it's processing uh, and it's been, you know, two months, um, this is something that Savvy can help to reach out to uh, Mohila and FSA with you to make sure that it's, it's getting processed appropriately. Um, you know, we want to make sure that it was submitted correctly. Um, and then from there, we, we can help uh, advocate on your behalf. Um, so I'm going to show you how you can, can work with us on that in just a bit. Uh, okay, let's see. Someone else asked, what happens if you have a loan from a school entity um, that uh, was driven by false advertisement um, and potentially based on immigration status? So there's actually a uh, forgiveness or I should say um, uh, cancellation program, uh, Nidra, uh, or Nidra, sorry, um, that uh, is available for those that took out loans and the school was either not up to merit uh, or they were uh, falsely advertised. And I'm, I will touch on that at the very, very end. We're not gonna go into detail on it tonight, but that's something that we can definitely help you with. Okay, I'm gonna keep, Chugging along here, but keep the questions coming. Um, these are great. All right, so now let's talk about income-driven repayment or IDR. So income-driven repayment plans can be a powerful way to help lower your monthly payment. But first, before I go into more detail on these, let me take a step back and just give some basic context as to how repayment on your student loans works. As, as far as federal student loans goes. Uh, when you go into repayment for the first time, right, and you are assigned to one of those student loan servicing companies, um, and you usually have a six month grace period, right, and then your first payment is due, um, every borrower is automatically put onto what's called the standard plan, okay? So when you get that first bill, you know, you look at it and it's usually a lot more than you were probably expecting, that is reflective of you being put onto this standard repayment plan. And the standard repayment plan calculates your monthly payment based on two things, how much student debt you have and the fact that you're gonna pay it off in 10 years, okay? So for someone like myself with over $200,000 in federal student loans, that comes out to, I think, around $1,800 a month or something like that on the standard plan. It's absurd. The Department of Education realized that uh, most uh, borrowers could not afford to make the monthly payment on those that the standard plan. So they introduced what are called income-driven repayment plans. And instead of basing your monthly payment on how much student debt you have and that 10-year payoff horizon, they base it on two other things, your income and your family size. So under these income-driven repayment plans, you could have half a million dollars in student loan debt. It wouldn't matter if you're making less than, let's say, $35,000 a year, you could qualify for as low as a $0 monthly payment, all right? So again, it's completely irrespective of uh, how much student debt you have. It's only going to look at your income and your family size to determine that monthly payment amount. So uh, just to, to get everyone organized here, there are four primary types of income-driven repayment plans. So you can kind of think of income-driven repayment or IDR as sort of the umbrella descriptor term here. And then there are four different types of IDR plans. There's the SAVE plan, which was formerly known as Repay, 
This is the newest income driven repayment plan that was introduced last summer by the Biden administration. There's the pay plan, which stands for pay as you earn, IBR, which stands for income based repayment, and ICR, which stands for income contingent repayment. Now, we're not going to go into the weeds on the differences between these plans tonight. Uh, the great thing about the savvy tool that I'm going to show you is it's going to be able to identify for you which plans are going to be best. A lot of it comes down to some technicalities like loan type, disbursement date, things like that, right? But I think it's just helpful to understand conceptually that there are four different types of these income-driven repayment plans. But generally, they all work the same way. They cap your monthly payment at anywhere between 5 to 20% of your discretionary income. So what is discretionary income? Well, part of your income is set aside to cover the cost of living, and that leftover amount is called discretionary income, and this is what your payment is based on. In reality, it comes out to your AGI, or your adjusted gross income. So this is going to be your pre-tax income, okay? Uh, so I'll give you an example. Let's say you file your taxes as single with no dependents and an income of around $52,000 a year. That's going to come out to around $160 a month on an income-driven repayment plan. And it's sort of a sliding scale from there. If your income's higher, that monthly payment amount's going to be higher. If your income's lower, that monthly payment's going to be lower, okay? And there's no cap to how much income uh, you can have. So you could be making half a million dollars a year and still be on an income-driven repayment plan, okay? Uh, and if your income is low enough, uh, you could uh, qualify for as low as a $0 monthly payment. Now, for every child dependent that you have, that's going to lower that monthly payment by about $50 per child, even unborn child dependents count. So if you're pregnant, that can count to help lower your uh, income-driven repayment plan. And another thing about these plans is that after you are on one of these for 20 to 25 years, depending upon the plan, you are eligible to receive forgiveness. Uh, another element that factors in here is your tax filing status, okay? So if you file your taxes as a single, it's gonna look just at your income. If you are married filing jointly, it's going to look at your joint income. If you are married filing separately, it will look at just your income, okay? So your tax filing status here does matter. Now, how do these programs generally work? Well, because everyone's automatically put on to that standard plan, if you remember, right? In order to enroll in one of these, you have to submit an application. Uh, and that application uh, requires you to answer some questions and attach supporting documentation attesting to your income. This can come in either the form of your most recent tax return or a pay stub from the last 90 days. That gets submitted to your servicer. Your servicer reviews it and says, okay, Lindsay, you're going to be on the save plan and your monthly payment is going to be $160 a month. And it locks that in for 12 months. Okay, so a year. 12 months comes and goes and you have what's called a recertification deadline. And by that deadline, and everyone's will be different because everyone's entering into these plans at different times, in order to maintain yourself in that program, you will need to resubmit an application with updated income documentation, right? And your servicer will basically do the same thing. They'll review it and then calculate your payment for the next 12 months. So the assumption being from year to year, based on any fluctuations in your income and family size, your payment amount could fluctuate either, either up or down, right? So it's not fixed or set like that standard plan would be. Now, uh, something that I want to make sure everyone is aware of, and this sort of uh, relates to some of these more recent and major policy updates, uh, because it impacts uh, enrollment right now in income-driven repayment plans. So this newest SAVE income-driven repayment plan that was introduced last summer, right, uh, has faced some challenges. And uh, earlier this summer, July 1, the second wave of improvements to this plan were supposed to go into effect. Uh, and those improvements included reducing the percentage of discretionary income for undergrad borrowers from 10% to 5%. And borrowers with lower balances were going to qualify for shortened timelines to forgiveness. So instead of 20 to 25, it could be 10 to 20. 
However, uh, as a result of some of these lawsuits that have come through and a July 18th ruling by a federal court, the entire save plan has been put on hold. Okay, so in response to the court ruling, here's what's occurred. Anyone who is already enrolled in the save plan, okay, was placed in an interest-free forbearance. Anyone attempting to en enroll in save right now will be put into a forbearance that may not necessarily be interest-free while they are trying to process these applications, okay? Another thing here is that uh, the servicers and each servicer we found, at least over the last couple of weeks, is somewhat behaving differently and treating this differently. Some have paused processing applications altogether. Some we are seeing a little bit of movement in processing, but either way, the Department of Education has removed the enrollment online. So uh, prior to this, you used to be able to enroll in an income-driven repayment plan online. You are not able to do that right now. However, they are still accepting paper applications. Uh, and the good thing uh, about Savvy, which I'm going to show you a little bit later on, is we've always used paper applications. We we digitize them and digitally fax them. Uh, so we have been un unaffected by this and are able to submit applications on behalf uh, of any borrower. Um, but you are not able to do so through your federal student aid account uh, at studentaid.gov. You know, I would say this as far as what's going to happen with this save plan, it's going to go to the Supreme Court again, um, and we may not hear a decision until their next wave of rulings in May of June of next year. Uh, so it could be a while uh, that borrowers are sort of put into this forbearance category um, where they're not responsible for making payments, um, but they are, are you know, prevented from, from continuing into the program. So one of the, the benefits uh, of Savvy is that we can be the source of information for you as far as any and all updates. I know it's tough to follow this stuff in the news. There's a lot of noise. Um, so we make sure to, uh, to keep everyone updated uh, who you know, has a Savvy account as far as any of these changes and how they may impact you as a borrower. All right, let me see here. I saw a few questions come through. Okay. All right. Someone asks, I haven't started paying my loans back yet because I just graduated. How soon can I apply for an IDR slash how long does it take to get approved? So this is a great question. Uh, so uh, assuming you just, you graduated, let's say maybe in May, but from whatever point you graduated, you have a six month grace period. So that would normally mean you would enter repayment uh, and have that first payment due in November of this year, Angel. Um, but it, it could be a little bit different. You should have been assigned a servicer, a loan servicer at this point, and uh, they would be able to tell you your exact due date. You can enroll in an income-driven repayment plan up to two months before that grace period ends. So uh, you should be able to enroll uh, shortly into one of those plans. Now, when it comes to how long it takes to get approved, well, as I was just saying on the previous slide, right, because of these lawsuits, it's taking longer and you're not able to enroll online. So this is where Savvy can be a little helpful for you, right? You can, we can submit the application uh, for you when it becomes time and then monitor that with you um, to ensure it actually gets reviewed. Um, because a lot of these applications, like I said, have been sort of delayed uh, in the processing, uh, but it should be about two months uh, is sort of the earliest that you can enroll in an income-driven repayment plan um, before that first repayment's due. All right. Now let's talk about public service loan forgiveness or PSLF. So PSLF, like I said, is one of the biggest and longest standing forgiveness programs out there. It was actually signed into law under the Bush administration in October of 2007. And essentially, it can forgive the remainder of your loan balance, whatever that may be. It could be $5,000. It could be $500,000. It doesn't matter. Tax-free, so there are no federal tax implications here, after you have made 120 qualifying payments. Now, if you could see me on video right now, you'd see that I'm doing qualifying payments in major air quotes. 
uh, because the devil's in the details as to what constitutes a qualifying payment. And it really comes down to satisfying these three things that you see on your screen right here. Number one, you have to work for a qualifying employer. This is any government organization at any level, federal, state, local, or tribal, or any non-for-profit 501c3. The only stipulation here is you must work a minimum of 30 hours or more per week. However, you can combine multiple or part-time employment to qualify, so long as all of the employers that you're combining are eligible and qualifying employers. Another thing about this program, as far as the employers go, is that it is retroactive back to October 2007. So any qualifying employment that you've had from October 2007 to present day is fair game. Unfortunately, nothing before October 2007 uh, is eligible for the purposes of this program. So if you've worked for three, four, maybe more qualifying employers over that time period, those can all retroactively count towards this program. Okay. You don't need to have worked for the same employer for the entire time, right? You can work for different employers again, as long as they are qualifying. So that's number one, your employer. Number two, you have to have a qualifying federal loan type. And the only type of federal loans that qualify are direct loans. This is why I made such a big deal about loan type earlier uh, in the presentation. If you have a non-direct loan, like a FELL loan or a Parent PLUS loan, you can consolidate those loans into a direct consolidation loan, and then it will become eligible, okay? And the number three, you need to be uh, making payments on that qualifying loan on a qualifying repayment plan. And the only types of repayment plans that qualify are income-driven repayment plans. You can be on any one of the four, it doesn't matter. You just need to be on one of them and making that payment for the on-time and full monthly amount. So you need to satisfy all three of these things simultaneously uh, and make 120 okay, of these payments while meeting all three of those requirements. So each payment needs to be made while you're working in public service for a qualifying employer, on your direct loans, and while enrolled in an income-driven repayment plan. After which point, right, you reach that 120 and the remainder of your balance is forgiven. Now, let me clear up a few common misconceptions about these 120 qualifying payments. First of all, they do not need to be made consecutively. You just need to make 120 total cumulative qualifying payments. So let's say you worked for two years for a qualifying employer and you accumulated 24 of these qualifying credits, right? And then you left and went to go work in the private sector or took time off, doesn't matter. Uh, nothing happens to those credits. They simply pause. And if you were to ever resume your eligibility by working for any qualifying employer, you can resume accumulating those credits. So again, these do not need to be made consecutively. You just need to reach 120 total. However, that being said, you can only receive one qualifying payment credit per one payment per one calendar month meaning you can't double up on payments in a month and get double the amount of credits, and you can't make a big lump sum payment and get more credits than you normally would. The easiest way to think about it is this. In any given calendar year of 12 months, the maximum amount of PSLM credits you can receive is 12. So if you can only receive 12 a year, right, and you have to get to 120 total, you're all very smart and can do the math, that's 10 years minimum, right, before you'd be eligible to receive forgiveness. And that would be if you were making them consecutively, which again, you don't have to, okay? So many people you know, refer to this program and think about it as a 10-year program, but I discourage you from doing that because to qualify, it really doesn't just come down to your service or time served. It comes down to these 120 qualifying credits. That's what's going to be the sort of the determination of when you're eligible to receive forgiveness. So for many people, it takes them longer than 10 years, right? Depending upon uh, how they accumulated those credits. Now, how do you apply for public service loan forgiveness? Well, there is one form and one form only for this program, and it's called the PSLF Employment Certification Form or ECF. This form gets signed off by you, the borrower, and then it needs to get signed off by your employer. 
your current or any previous employers you may have had that you are trying to qualify with. Uh, so let's say you've worked for a total of four qualifying employers, your current employer and maybe three previous employers, right? That would mean you need to submit four employment certification forms, one for each of those employers. Uh, and someone, in, usually in HR, who has access to your employment record would sign off on that form attesting to your dates of employment or if you're still employed, that you worked 30 hours or more, et cetera. That gets signed off and then that gets submitted to uh, federal student aid, right? Or the Department of Education. They review that form and they say, okay, Lindsay, you know, as of right now, okay, or as of the date that this was last certified on that form, you have 80 credits towards PSLF, okay? And then uh, if you are sort of somewhere, you know, along the way towards that 120, right? Every year it's advised uh, that you submit a form for your most recent or current employer. That way you're basically certifying the past 12 months worth of credits, inching your way closer and closer to that 120. You can absolutely wait until you think you've reached the 120 before you submit all these forms, but I highly discourage you from doing this for a couple of different reasons. One, it's going to take them a long time, and I'm talking three, six, sometimes more months to review your forms because they've got to go way back in your repayment history across multiple employers, right? Uh, and there's more room for them to make an error. But two, if you wait and, and do it based on just you thinking that you've, you've accumulated these credits, oftentimes borrowers find that they didn't satisfy all three of those things and so don't have the credits that they thought they did. So again, it's, it's not required, but highly encouraged that you submit these forms early and often. Uh, I would say on a yearly basis is probably good enough, but if you've just been, let's say, working for one or two years, you're just starting out, you can submit the, this form, get those credits under your belt, and again, you can continue submitting each year until you reach that 120. And the great news is that we have many union members with us tonight who are PSLF eligible. Uh, I put a few here that I know have PSLF eligible members, uh, but there are many, many more. Uh, again, it's based on your employer, okay? Uh, it doesn't matter in what capacity you work for that employer. Uh, it, all that matters is the employer on that W-2. Um, and the great thing about the Savvy tool, which I'm gonna show you shortly, is that uh, you'll be able to look up and confirm whether or not you know, your current or past employers are eligible for the program. Um, so that, that's something that's great about uh, that Savvy account. All right, before I talk about some of the more recent uh, and major policy updates, let me just take a quick peek at the Q&A. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. All right, so someone asked, I, uh, if I'm in the SAVE program and my payment is $0, does that still qualify? So Brittany, if you're referring to, does it still qualify for public service loan forgiveness? The answer is yes, it absolutely does. That's actually the ideal situation, right? Because if you're trying to, to qualify for public service loan forgiveness, right, and have that balance forgiven, you don't want to pay any more than you have to. So you want to minimize that monthly payment, right, and maximize the forgiveness. So yes, if you qualify for a $0 income-driven repayment, uh, those all count as qualifying credits towards public service loan forgiveness. Another thing that I want to mention the period during the COVID pandemic payment pause. So when all borrowers were automatically put into a payment pause from March of 2020 through last September, 2023, I believe it's 43 months total. That entire period of time counts as qualifying PSLF credits. So if you were working for a qualifying employer during that time, even though you didn't have to make payments for three plus years, that entire period counts which is really, really great news. That basically could put you a third of the way closer uh, to full forgiveness without having to pay a dime. All right, let's see here. Uh, I see a few more questions coming through. Um, I'm gonna try to see, okay. All right, someone asked, what if my weekly hours are five minutes short of 30 hours per week? So I will say this, the 
really the employer has discretion as to how they want to sign off on your form. I know many employers who, you know, so if they have an employee, sometimes some weeks they are, you know, under 30, some weeks they're over 30, right? And they decide we're going to look at the average across that period of time. But if it, it's coming down to five minutes or so, you know, this is somewhere where <laughs> Savvy could actually, you know, reach out and perhaps be an advocate and encourage them uh, to sign off on the form and sort of round up on that period of time. Uh, because technically, if you were at 29.5 or higher, or right, right below the 30, it's supposed to round up to the nearest whole number on that form. So you should be, you should be good to go. But again, this is where we could help uh, sort of explain to your employer how to sign off on that form. All right, I uh, just being cognizant of the time, gonna keep going because we still have one more really important topic to get to. Um, and then uh, I wanna show everyone how to get started with Savvy. And then I promise for anyone that can stick around, I will stick around as long as need be to answer any remaining questions. All right, the big, big uh, sort of policy update that I want everyone to be aware of is uh, this 12 month on-ramp to repayment that is coming to an end at the end of this month, September 30th, all right? So this is really, really important. I wanna make sure everyone is aware of what's going on. So what was the on-ramp to repayment? So in order to help borrowers return to repayment for the first time last fall, okay, uh, after nearly three plus years on pause as a result of COVID, the Department of Education instituted this 12 month, what they called on-ramp to repayment, which again started last October 1st, 2023, and is coming to an end September 30th, 2024. And basically this was a safety net, okay, put in place uh, to prevent borrowers who were struggling to return to repayment again because it was on pause for so long. Um, and what it what it prevented was uh, delinquency and default or any of the negative consequences if they missed a payment. So if you were late, missed that payment, made a partial payment, you wouldn't be reported delinquent or go into default during this period. Okay. Interest would still accrue during this time if you know if you missed those payments and payments were still technically due. Okay. So you should make them if you can. Um, again, especially if you were trying to pursue a program like public service loan forgiveness, right? Where making that payment is going to, to garner you that credit. Um, however, if you didn't, you wouldn't be penalized in the same ways, all right? So during that this 12 month period of time. However, that is coming to an end. So this period of protection is ending again, September 30th, the end of this month. So what that means is starting October 1 and for the October month of due dates, okay, for your payment, the rules from the sort of pre-COVID-19 forbearance will take uh, back, will go back into effect. So student loans can fall into delinquency and or default. Your missed payments uh, can and will be reported to the credit bureaus. Your credit scores can drop as a result of those missed payments. Uh, and if you are in delinquency and default, for a long enough period of time, uh, aside from being reported to the, the debt collection agencies, you will go into a uh, wage garnishment or have your tax uh, refund uh, and or social security garnished as well. I will tell you that is a situation you do not want to get into. Wage garnishment, they will take 15% of every paycheck and you have, you have no say, you can't do anything about it. And it's very, very difficult to get out of that situation. Uh, I've had borrowers who've had to quit their jobs because they can't afford to be employed uh, because it's taking so much of uh, their income uh, towards that student loan payment. So again, very important to be aware that this is coming to an end, okay? How to prepare for the end of this on-ramp. Uh, a few things, okay, to make sure that you, you sort of check these off before September uh, 30th. First, review your loan details. Okay, again, make sure you know your servicer, you have access to that online account, your contact information is updated, uh, and check to see when your next due date is. You also wanna check to see if your loans were placed into a forbearance. Again, many borrowers that were enrolled in uh, the SAVE plan or who attempted to roll in the SAVE plan in the last couple of months have been placed into this forbearance as a result of the lawsuits. 
it will you know show that you have a zero dollar payment due that's you're all good to go you don't have to make a payment okay and you'll remain in uh forbearance for the time being uh but if it's showing you have a due date and a payment amount due that means you have a payment amount due and you are not in a forbearance so you'll want to explore your repayment options uh, and again, as I'm going to show you in a second here, this is where Savvy can come in. We're going to show you what uh, that best payment option can look like, especially on an income-driven repayment plan, how you might be able to lower that, and then we can help to enroll you in that plan. And then you're going to want to sort of budget and think about what that monthly payment is going to look like uh, going forward. If you enroll in auto debit through your student loan servicer, Usually they offer a 0.5% interest rate reduction if you're enrolled in auto debit. So that might be something to think about. Um, and again, this is really where Savvy can come in to help you every step of the way. So our goal is to sort of simplify this uh, repayment process, uh, show you your options and help you get enrolled. Uh, and we offer a premium level of plans where you can access one-on-one -on -one support, have a dedicated uh, student loan expert that's going to be sort of on your uh, case and help you every step of the way to make that transition smoother. And I'm going to talk about that in just a bit. Okay, uh, we're going to skip through this pulse check because I'm just being aware of time. Uh, I want to make sure that I get uh, to show you all how you can get started with Savvy. Um, I know that this has been a lot of information in one sitting. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, and oftentimes, you know, while these programs can be helpful, uh, it can leave you feeling lost and overwhelmed. You're not sure which plan is best for you, if you're doing the right thing, if your payments are qualifying, right? All these factors come into play to make it really overwhelming and confusing. And that's really where Savvy comes in and, and our role in all of this. Uh, as I'm about to show you, you know, when you start your savvy accountant process, we ask you some basic questions. Uh, and from that, we're able to show you a personalized repayment and forgiveness plan. So like down to the cent as to what you'd qualify for, when you'd potentially receive forgiveness, things like that. We also monitor for new programs and policy changes. That's one of my main roles here at Savvy. And we communicate with, uh, with borrowers when and if there is something important and if you need to take action. So you don't need to worry about trying to filter through the noise on the news. Uh, you know, we can be your direct line of expertise. Uh, and then, like I said, we offer a premium level of services where uh, for a small fee, you can have us take on all of the administrative burden for you, all of the paperwork and applications to get enrolled in income-driven repayment, public service loan forgiveness, we do it all for you. And the best part is you have access to one-on-one -on -one support at any point in time. You get an email from your servicer and you're not sure what it means. You can forward it to your agent savvy. We'll tell you if you need to take action. Uh, you know, you submit an application and you never heard back, right? Savvy can be your advocate and we escalate that case with your servicer. So it's sort of that point of contact uh, through all the different touch points that, that re requires you know, sort of navigating this process on your own, that's where we come in. And we try to make it as easy as possible using technology. So instead of having to fill out a bunch of different of these applications, especially since there's no online enrollment right now, right? You're gonna have to fax or snail mail these in on your own. With Savvy, there's one application, we call it the Savvy application, almost like a TurboTax for your student loans. We collect that information and then show you your options. And then we enroll all of those for you. Uh, so it really is as easy as a click of a button. So to get started, uh, you can scan the QR code here, or if you wanna just follow along with me for the time being, everyone is gonna receive an email after this with sort of an activation link. So you can get started with your account then. Um, I'm just gonna sort of walk through and show you just to give you a look and feel of sort of what this process and experience is, is like and what Savvy can offer. So when you sign into your Savvy account at any point in time, you see your Savvy dashboard. And this is sort of like mission control for everything student loans. Uh, it's where you're gonna be able to do a lot of different things, track your applications, et cetera. You can also, from that dashboard, invite your friends and family, okay? So if you have friends, colleagues, family members with student loan debt, you can simply put in their email address and they will get an invitation email 
uh, to create their savvy account. I will say this, if you invite three or more friends and family, you get a 50% off coupon code to use towards those premium services, uh, which I'll touch on in just a second here. Uh, the friends and family don't need to do anything. They don't even need to activate their savvy account. All you need to do is enter their email addresses and you get that 50% off coupon code. And when you're ready to get started with the savvy process, it's fairly simple. Like I said, very similar to almost like a turbo tax for your student loans. We're gonna ask you some basic questions around uh, your tax filing status, uh, you know, your dependents, uh, your income, right? All these things factor into uh, you know, our ability to calculate the best repayment option for you. We also ask about your employment. This is what's gonna be critical in uh, helping us determine your eligibility for forgiveness. We have a database built into our tool of all of the public service loan forgiveness, as well as teacher loan forgiveness. We didn't talk about that program tonight, but that's another uh, forgiveness program specifically for Title I teachers. We have all of those qualifying players built into our, our system. So when you start typing in the name of your employer, it'll pop up from a drop-down menu. You'll be able to select it. We'll ask you some further clarifying questions from there. I encourage you to add not only your current employer, but any previous employers you may have had, because again, these programs are retroactive. And then the last step on the tool is adding your student loan information. Uh, so you, we provide an option to sync your loans where you can select your servicer. Uh, you can enter in your student loan servicer credentials and it'll pull that information automatically, or you can enter it in manually. Uh, so we offer a couple different options for you to get that loan info in there, but it's obviously important for us to see this is where we can detect if you have a loan type that would require consolidation. Uh, but this is where we also are able to see your balance rate, interest rate, loan type, things like that that are important in calculating these things. And then that's it. Once you've done that, you reach the end, which we call our plan options page. And this is where we show you what your best options could be as far as repayment and potential forgiveness. So you could see, for example, here, what that new monthly payment could be, uh, what that total payment over time looks like. So how much you will have paid by the end, how long until you'd be eligible for forgiveness, I mean, down to the year and month, and how much in forgiveness you'd be eligible to receive. You can expand below for more details. You can see this compared to the standard plan. You know, sometimes you'll see shorter payoff versus lower monthly payment, right? All of that is captured on that plan options page. And from there, the next part of the process is to submit the applications to enroll in these programs, right? And that's where you have some options. You can either choose our DIY and continue on completely for free. Uh, and that's where we will send you the application instructions and the applications themselves and you'll be responsible for submitting those to your servicer, all right? Uh, or if you'd like Savvy to take on that administrative burden for you uh, and to have access to one-on-one -on -one support uh, at any point in time, that's where we offer this essential plan here, right in the middle, at $50 a year. It's 100% money back guarantee. So at any point in time, you can request a refund, no questions asked. So that's a year, not a, a month. Uh, and that gives you access to all of the digital application enrollment, monitoring, access to one-on-one -on -one support via telephone, email, chat, the whole nine yards. Uh, we have an internal team of student loan experts of about nine people that I've trained personally. Uh, and those are the ones that are going to be working on your case with you every step of the way. We also offer a pro level. Uh, and this is sort of the highest uh, level of sort of concierge service. If you're not the most tech savvy, you want to schedule a, a time and appointment to sit down with someone and have them walk you through the process, explain things to you, talk things out. Uh, that is definitely the pro route. You can actually schedule a time and a date for a, a session right from your savvy account at any point in time. Uh, they walk you through everything, do everything for you. Uh, so again, that's offered at $140 a year, 100% money back guarantee. Uh, but again, mo most popular is usually that essential, but you can also do it all for free under the DIY. And we provide you with all those instructions to help you along the way.
just to give you a, a sort of a look and feel of what the premium memberships um, you know, include. So on the left here, this is someone with three different qualifying employers for public service loan forgiveness. With the click of a button, start ECF, we actually pre-fill and generate those forms and send them to their employers for them. So on your behalf. So you don't have to print something out, drive an hour to your former employer, try to track someone down. We manage the entire process for you start to finish. Uh, and on the right here, you'll just see, this is how we sort of pre-fill and digitize the income driven repayment plan application, for example. I mean, it's as simple as you get it via email, you click it open on your phone, you can e-sign, attach the paperwork uh, and get it done in less than 10 minutes. And then once those applications are in motion or in progress, you can track them all from one place, your savvy dashboard. So again, you can see the same person with three different employment certification forms here in progress, as well as their income driven repayment application. Uh, and on the right here, zoomed in is exactly where they are in the process. What uh, has been submitted on their behalf, what we might still need from you, the borrower, right? One of the most frustrating things I find as a borrower in working directly with my servicer is the lack of transparency or visibility I have into what's going on. I submitted an application two months ago and I haven't heard anything. Did they even receive it? Is it being processed? What's happening? And when I try to call, no one, I can't get a hold of a human or get a straight answer, right? This is really where Savvy comes in. We monitor those applications. If they haven't been processed within a certain period of time by your servicer, we have a trigger that goes off uh, and we're able to follow up with you and the servicer to ensure we hold them accountable and we get that form escalated. So it really helps to prevent all the different points in which borrowers will fall through the cracks to no fault of their own. And then last but not least, our customer support. Uh, you can click contact support right from your Savvy account, send our team a message. Uh, we have a telephone number that you'll see when you click contact support as well. Um, I know it says response time three to five days, that is outdated. Uh, usually our response times are within 12 to 24 hours. Uh, and when you call our telephone, uh, our wait time is 1.4 seconds. <laughs> I say that with pride because I know how long it takes to get through to someone on the phone with your servicer. Um, but uh, we really pride ourselves on, on being able to, to provide you with human support and from experts who know your case. So you won't have to explain you know, the same thing each time you call, you have a dedicated person that is working with you uh, and your student loans. So I know we are uh, a bit over time. Uh, I apologize again, I'm gonna stay on to answer uh, some of these questions, but just wanna make sure everyone sort of has a few next steps here. Again, you're all gonna receive an email with sort of an activation for your Savvy account that you can take these next steps. Um, I highly encourage you, especially with the September 30th deadline, you know, coming up and October being really the first month in which any missed or late payments are going to start to have negative consequences. Um, and especially because the servicers are delayed in processing applications, borrowers aren't hearing anything when they apply and you can't apply online. Savvy can be there to really assist you every step of the way. And last thing I just want to offer up before I go to the Q&A uh, if you'd like to have a student loan webinar, just like this one tonight, uh, hosted for your local, um, we are available to do so upon request. Uh, I'm going to put a link in the chat right now. It takes two seconds, just your name, email, and local, um, and we'll follow up with more details, completely free of charge. Um, but we are, you know, really serious about trying to help, uh, union members with their student loans, so if you think that a session like this would be valuable uh, for your fellow union members and your local, we would love uh, to host one. You know, we can figure out a time and day that works best. So you can scan the QR code here, or let me just put this link in the chat for everyone to access. Like I said, it takes two seconds uh, to just submit that interest uh, and we will follow up with you shortly. Woo, okay. <laughs> Uh, all right. Thanks to those who have, have stuck around. Actually, I see most of you. All right. I'm going to hit the Q&A now. All right. Let's see. We got a lot of questions. Just so, so everyone knows, we have uh, about 26 questions that have come through. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my best. If I haven't gotten to yours yet and you're still on, 
you feel free to re repost it or repaste it in the Q and A. I apologize. I'm going to start from the bottom just so I know where, uh, how I've left off. Uh, but I, I promise I'll stick around uh, as long as I need to, to get to everyone. Okay, let's see here. Uh, someone asked, I have a parent plus loan from school that was included in a class action lawsuit that was approved by courts for loan forgiveness. Is there a deadline for applying for that loan forgiveness? No, there shouldn't be. However, I would say applying sooner rather than later, just because unfortunately, when it comes to student loan policy, federal student loan policy, a lot of it has become political. And so, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the upcoming election, but I would say while that, that program and that, that forgiveness exists now, you should put in that application and try to take advantage of it because I can't say what the landscape could look like in a year or two years from now. All right. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, someone else asks, I made all 120 payments. I submitted my last PS left form on July 30th. I'm on the save plan, which is tied up with the court decision. What can I do? Okay, Valerie, this is a great question. So um, uh, it's great that you've submitted that last form on July 30th. I'm curious if they have reviewed it or if you have been awarded those credits yet. I know that there was a bit of a sort of a pause in reviewing PSLF applications over the summer, uh, but they've now resumed reviewing those. So you should be able to check uh, your credit count now, uh, not in Mohila, but at studentaid.gov. So your credit should have been transferred over because the sort of management of PSLF moved back in-house to student aid. So studentaid.gov, logging in there, you should be able to see how many credits you have and the status of that PSLF form. That being said, um, if one or two of those months, right, to make it to that 120, you've been on this forbearance because of save, uh, what you are going to be able to do is use something called the PSLF buyback. And give me one second here. I am going to post a link in the chat while I'm stopping my screen share. Let me just get this link. This is from the Department of Education website. It is, hold on. So PSLF buyback is essentially once you, you've reached the 120 qualifying payments as far as uh, as far as years or time served. And let's say there were a couple months, such as during the save forbearance that aren't counting for PSLF, that you would like to count uh, towards that 120 or you need to count towards that 120. You can essentially buy them back for whatever you were supposed to pay on the plan you were on. So let's say you're on save right now and you qualify for a $20 monthly payment, okay? Through this pay PSLF buyback, you would be able to purchase the one or two months that you need remaining to get to that 120 for $20 a month, right? So whatever plan you'd qualify for. So let me put this link uh, for anyone who needs it into the PSLF. This is the PSLF buyback um, program that was introduced earlier this year. Uh, and you are not able to, to do that until you have 120 months worth of, of service under your belt. And you're trying to basically get the payments to match the service time, if that makes sense. So Valerie, let me know if you have any follow-up questions on that, but that's what you'd want to utilize if you run into to any issues or you're a few short of that 120 because of this forbearance. Okay. Someone else asked, should I sign up for Savvy now when I don't have any student loans yet? I would say there's no harm in signing up, right? And obviously, you know, it's free to sign up. And what that will at least ensure you is you will start receiving some of our policy updates and communications. Um, so we we send out uh, email communications when there have been important policy changes. Um, and we also have, we host uh, actually, I mean, almost on a daily basis, but weekly webinars, uh, especially around new policy updates and things like that. You can have access to all that. So just so you can keep apprised and if and when you decide to take out student loans, we can always be there, but that way we can, you know, sort of be your trusted source on, on any of this stuff. All right, let's see. Okay. What are the cons of consolidating loans? Okay. So uh, just to be clear, you know, I want to differentiate consolidation from refinancing. 
refinancing. Okay, let's say you have uh, federal student loans. Refinancing those loans, right, at a lower interest rate would turn those federal loans private, meaning you'd no longer have access to any federal repayment, forgiveness, or relief programs. Okay. Uh, I get emails all the time, right, from SoFi, you know, say refinance your loans at a lower rate, right? By doing that, again, you will lose access to any federal forgiveness repayment benefits. Uh, now, consol consolidation, okay, right, that federal process. Uh, the reason really to do it is if you have a loan type that requires consolidation in order to be eligible. So there's sort of, let's say you have fell loans and you want to be eligible for public service loan forgiveness and have, have them forgiven. You can't be eligible without consolidating. Same thing with parent plus loans, right? So there's sort of no way around it. Uh, otherwise, I see a lot of people consolidate because they think it's con more convenient. Let's say, you know, you have maybe six or seven different loans, right? As most borrowers do, because it's not all dispersed in one lump sum, right? It's throughout the course of your studies. And they want to just bring it into one. Well, here's what I'd keep in mind. When you consolidate, it uh, turns your interest rate into a weighted average of those interest rates. So perhaps, you know, if you had loans from different periods of time and different interest rates, right? It may not be to your advantage. So I would say first is, your loan type. If it's a loan type that would require consolidation in order to be eligible for a program you want, that's you know going to be your determining factor. Um, but otherwise, let's say you're not trying to apply for any of those programs, you're not trying to get forgiveness, then yes, you may want to consider, well, is consolidating actually going to potentially slightly increase my interest rate uh, based on the fact that you know maybe these balances are different. I have a really high balance on one of my higher interest rate loans right? And that's now going to take my lower interest rate with a lower balance and make it higher. So there, there are some factors and considerations there. And that's really where a conversation with one of our experts can be helpful. Um, but at least going through the Savvy uh, tool and setting up that account, entering that information, like I said, we will be able to detect if you have loan types that would require that consolidation in order to be eligible and enroll. And we sort of hold your hand through that process. Um, because you know, with consolidation, right, it's irreversible. So we want to make sure that it's the right decision for your specific situation. Okay, let's see here. Uh, someone else asked, all right. Um, do you have to pay for your service every year for the life of your loan? Absolutely not. You can, uh, you decide uh, each year or whenever uh, if you want to upgrade or downgrade, I would say I know many borrowers who, you know, their first year, right, when they're trying to take care of all this paperwork, they upgrade to the essential. And then after that, it's sort of on autopilot and they know what to do and they don't need the essential anymore, right? So you can totally decide year to year at any point in time, you know, you can get the refund if you want to, right? Uh, there's no sort of commitment. There's no um, sort of recurring, you know, uh, billing, right. That you are unaware of. It's completely up to you, uh, when, and if you want to decide from year to year. All right. Someone else asks, what if you are currently a student and on your repayment, there is interest that is being accrued on student loans when there was none prior. Can you advise here? Okay. So if you are, uh, all right, uh, let me say this. If you are currently in school and you had uh, prior student loans, which I'm assuming is, is the situation you're referring to, usually when you go back to school and, and you have existing student loan debt, they will, depending upon your, your student status, if you're full-time or, or part-time, but usually if you're full-time, they will put your existing student loans into what's called an in-school deferment. And that means that you uh, don't have to make payments but those loans still accumulate interest. So that could be what you're seeing, okay? Also, if you had prior loans that went into repayment, they may not have been accumulating interest before they went into repayment, but now they are. So there are a couple of different scenarios in which, in which that could occur. It could it also matter whether these are unsubsidized or subsidized. Um, so uh, we are happy to look more into that with you, but that could, that's, that's fairly common as far as, uh, you know, depending upon your in-school or out-of-school status, when that interest will start. 
Okay, let's see here. Um, someone else asked, uh, can we get the recording of this session? Yes, everyone will receive a copy of this recording. Uh, also, how can extended family participate? Oh, let me share my screen here. So, hold on. All right, let me quickly go back a few screens. So you can invite any family or friends or colleagues, fellow union members from your savvy dashboard. Hold on right here, almost there, there we go. Invite friends or family right there. You can enter their email address in, they will get an email invitation to set up their savvy account uh, and access everything that I've showed you here tonight. Um, and the benefit is if you are interested in one of those premium plans, if you invite three friends or family, you get a 50% off coupon code right into your inbox right away. Um, I would say that's a no brainer. Again, they don't have to, they don't have to upgrade or do anything. You just need to enter in the email addresses. I'll be honest with you. So, uh, it's a great way to, I mean, now that $50 a year is, you know, $25 a year, which is incredible for the amount of support that you're going to be able to get. All right. Let's see here. Okay. Someone else asked, can you switch from one type of IDR to another? Yes, you can switch. However, it would just require submitting uh, a new application, income-driven repayment application. All right, let's see here. Okay. Uh, if I, someone asked if I decide to do the $50 a month, when is payment due? Okay. So that it's not $50 a month for that premium plan. It's one time, $50 a year. So one, one time. Um, and that would, you can choose to upgrade whenever you want. You can do so, you know, through your savvy account and here, I'll show you right here, uh, from your savvy dashboard on the left, it'll say your savvy plan. And this is indicating someone's savvy essential, but it'll show if you haven't selected a plan, you can click and you'll be given the option to upgrade right there. Um, so that, that is just one, one time for the, for the entire year that that would be $50. And again, if you invite three friends or family, you get 50% off that. Um, so you can you can choose to upgrade at any point in time um, and that will give you access to one-on-one -on -one support, um, you know, and all that good stuff from there. Uh, and yes, uh, Tyron, if you make your savvy account um, and you enter in those employers, we're gonna be able to tell you if you are eligible for PSLF and how far along you are towards that 120. And if you have a parent plus loan, we're going to indicate that you'll need to consolidate. We'll help you with that. And um, then at which point, you know, we can submit all those forms for you. So absolutely. Okay. Let's see here. Um, Kamani, I'm reading your question. Uh, okay. So this uh, person asks, I was on the program where I had $0 monthly payments. And I just looked and it says, I have to pay for my entire loan by November 30th, 2024. Uh, should I contact student aid first? I would say, um, I'd be curious if, it, if it's showing your entire loan as due, it might be showing, you might be looking at just the balance total and not that monthly payment, but go through, add your information into your savvy account um, and you can try to reach out to student aid, although, you know, it might take a while for you to get through, but if you are still confused or they're not able to get, get you the right information, I would, uh, upgrade to that savvy essential and reach out to our support team and they can, they'll respond to you within less than 24 hours. Can even get on the phone with you. You can call tomorrow, uh, because I believe our support team is on till 8 PM Eastern. So, uh, but if you call now. Um, you can leave a voicemail, but you can set something up right away. Uh, but absolutely you can try to contact student aid, uh, student aid first, but it could either be an error, um, or, or maybe the way that it's appearing on your, on your screen, but that definitely sounds unusual and shouldn't be the case. So, like I said, you can reach out to student aid first, uh, and, you know, depending upon the outcome, we're always here to help. Okay, someone else asks, I may have missed it. Does the federal work study program count? Uh, I'm not sure if you're referring to whether it counts for public service loan forgiveness. Um, I don't believe, unless you were an employee and received a W-2 
from your university and work 30 hours or more a week, that is the only scenario in which it would count. Uh, but I'm not sure, DJ, about the, the federal work study program. I'm not too familiar with that, but I can look uh, I can look into that and try to get some more information for you. Okay, someone else asks, if you have a previous loan and are currently in school, uh, will it affect your credit score? Can I decide how much I want to pay monthly? So if you have a previous student loan and you're currently in school, again, it, it's somewhat depends upon your enrollment status, whether you're part-time or, or full-time. I believe you need to be full-time in order to qualify for what's called in-school deferment. Meaning if you're in school right now and you have prior existing student loans, you don't have to make payments on them, okay, while you're still in school, all right? So I would talk to your uh, the financial aid office um, because they will have information on, based on your enrollment status, what you would qualify for. However, as far as, you know, uh, let's say you don't qualify for in-school deferment and, you know, you need to be in repayment on those other loans. Uh, when it comes to how much to pay monthly, that's where enrolling in an income-driven repayment plan can help get that monthly payment down really low. So you can't this you can't decide how much you want to pay. It's based on you know your income, um, or depending upon how much student loan debt you have, it may be lower uh, on one of the standard plans. And so if you go through and set up that savvy account, we'll be able to show you what those monthly payment options look like on those different repayment plans. Okay, so someone else asked, what happens if I start a payment and my daughter decides to go back to school? Do the payments stop or do I continue to make a payment? So Taryn, because you have Parent PLUS loans, right, which are in your name, those are uh, unrelated to her, <laughs> un unrelated to your daughter. Uh, so uh, once they go into repayment, right, if she decides to go back to school, your, they will continue to be in repayment. It's only you know if she takes out student loans in her name, but for your parent plus loan, um, even if she goes back to school, because it's a parent plus loan in your name, you will need to continue to make those payments. All right. I'm st I know I definitely missed some questions. So if you're still on and I didn't get to your question, if you wouldn't mind just maybe reposting it in the Q and A, so I see it right at the bottom, um, I'll be able to answer it for you. Apologize, we got I have a lot coming, a lot of questions coming through. So I want to make sure I get to to everyone, especially if you're still on. Okay, this is a great question. So someone asked, given my 11 years of employment with the state and my recent graduation, how can I best leverage the public service loan forgiveness program or other state slash federal forgiveness programs to maximize my eligibility for loan forgiveness? And what steps should I ensure that my previous years of service count towards forgiveness? Great question. So when it comes to public service loan forgiveness, remember to keep in mind that you need to satisfy those three things, right? So let's say you have 11 years of employment with the state, but you only took out loans or those loans only went into repayment within the last year, right? Unfortunately, the time prior to when the loans went into repayment doesn't count because you need to have student loans in repayment, right? During the time that you're working for that qualifying employer. So you basically, you know, sort of, you need those things aligned and that would be sort of the point at which you could start the clock towards that 120, okay? Now, that being said, if you, you know, uh, you say, you know, sort of your recent graduation, perhaps maybe you had student loans, you know, from before, again, you want to sort of think about whenever your student loans went into repayment first, that's the start of the clock. And then when that sort of employment history overlaps with that, right, is what's going to count. So despite, you know, over a decade of employment with the state, if you've only recently graduated and only recently gone into repayment, that's when that clock is going to start. And that previous 10, 11 years, right, is not necessarily going to count towards that. Um, that being said, if you plan on working in public in a public service capacity, right, for any qualifying employer going forward, then you can certainly set yourself up now, right, 
submit that employment certification form and start tracking towards that forgiveness. And your goal would be right to minimize your monthly payment on an income driven repayment plan and maximize that forgiveness through PSLF. Although you'd be, you know, likely nine or 10 years away. Um, these are just assumptions I'm making based on, on your question. Um, however, if there were, if your loans or you have loans from earlier on, right, again, that clock's going to start when those loans went into repayment. However, I do know that there are hundreds of state, uh, state forgiveness programs, as well as occupation forgiveness programs. And through Savvy, when you start entering in that employment information, we actually also have a database of most, if not all of the state slash occupation related forgiveness programs that are out there. And so some of those are a little bit different. It's sometimes, you know, two consecutive years and $50,000 that you get, right? There are sort of different parameters. Uh, when you go through the savvy process, you'll be direct. You'll see sort of where it indicates uh, how you can explore more forgiveness program opportunities. And that is something that you may want to look into um, you know, if you're trying to, you know, get to that forgiveness sooner rather than having to sort of start at this point in time. So hopefully that makes sense, but you know, this is where, again, our, our, uh, um, our team can really help you sort of walk through, you know, what those options can look like. Okay. So still employed with the state. That's great. So again, you know, if, if you, your loans just went into repayment, right? So this, the clock's sort of starting, you know, about now if you've recently graduated. So you can basically under public service loan forgiveness, at least, right? You'd probably be about, you know, 10, uh, 10 or so years away, um, you know, and, and needing to continue to work for a qualifying employer. It's tough because, you know, I, I see many borrowers who are, you know, in your same situation where they've had the years of service but it needs to overlap with the loans being in repayment. All right, someone else asks, um, I was told I can qualify for an extra year of forgiveness, but no info on how to do it for PSLF. Do you know what I can do? Um, okay, Berkeley Local One. I'm not sure what you mean by an extra year of forgiveness. Um, do you mean that you could qualify for like an additional year's worth of credits towards the 120, um, assuming maybe you're in progress towards that 120. Um, if maybe you can provide a little bit more context, uh, that would be great. Or if maybe you are retired or left working and you were told you could sort of get that year back, that would count towards the 120. Um, if that's the case, then the PSLF buyback that I put in the chat, and I'll, I'll post it again here, in the chat as well, that could be something that could help you to get to that 120. Um, so if you've you know left and you are looking to buy back periods of time for credit, yes, this PS left buyback, and I put the link right there in the chat, that sort of explains how to go about doing that process. Again, that's something that the savvy team can help you to do as well. Cause I will, I'm not gonna lie, it's a bit uh it's a bit dense. <laughs> um, it's a bit technical. So uh, but yes, that's absolutely possible. All right, someone else asked, uh, the friend and family invite, is that for people in school or for anyone you wanna tell about the Savvy program? Anyone you wanna tell about the Savvy program. <laughs> uh, they can be in school, out of school, really anyone. Okay, Monica asks, I've been paying my child's loans for the past year under the Parent PLUS loans. I have now retired. Do any of the past 10 years count towards repayment forgiveness? Uh, so uh, Monica, if you, uh, we're working for a, a qualifying employer for, for public service loan forgiveness. That is unfortunately, you know, with these parent plus loans, right. Um, because they went into repayment within you know the last year, I'm assuming, right. That's when that clock starts. So really, you know, even don't be upset about the fact that you've retired, you really didn't miss out on any forgiveness because again, that wouldn't have counted towards public service loan forgiveness because you didn't have loans in repayment. So again, when it comes to, to public service loan forgiveness, right, it's not just about time served. You need to have, you know, federal student loans in repayment. That's when that clock starts and it needs to sort of overlap uh, with the, the, you know, qualifying employment. Um, so that wouldn't have counted at least towards, 
you know, those, the parent plus loans that, uh, that you have. Okay, let's see here. Someone else asked, Sabrina, can you switch from one type of IDR to another? For example, the standard income driven to save, will you be denied the switch if you are already reaping the benefit of $0 repayment? I want to the benefit of no interest. Okay, so Sabrina, were you are you currently enrolled in an income driven repayment plan right now and qualify for the $0 monthly payment? Um, because if so, uh, I would say trying to switch into save is going to be, you can do it. It's going to be lengthy and there's no guarantee that that's going to happen anytime soon and, or that the save program will still be around, but yes, you can do that. Um, you would need to submit a new income driven repayment application. And that's something we, we can help you to do. Okay, how do you go about false reporting from student loan uh, uh, servicers on your credit report and also not adding to public service loan forgiveness? Okay, so uh, the best place if you uh, are seeing any issues as far as uh, you know how things are being reported on your credit um, and you know sort of anything else as far as scam, uh, you know. Um, uh, you know, what may seem like unlawful or wrong behavior on the part of any of these entities, there are two sort of sources um, of escalation here that I would recommend. The first is the uh, Federal Student Loan Ombudsman. Hold on. I'm going to put this in the chat. Um, if you Google that, it should take you to the Federal Student Aid site where you can actually submit uh, a complaint, file a complaint, and you'll have a case number created um, within the, the Federal Student Aid Ombudsman's office. That office is in charge of basically making sure borrowers are protected. There's also the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Okay. I'm putting that here. Um, and if you go to the CFPB website, you can also submit and file a claim uh, about any uh, sort of malicious or or uh, negative, you know, uh, consequences or impacts or behaviors or whatever um, from any of these servicers. Uh, so those are the two sort of uh, points, highest points of sort of escalation for cases like this. Again, if you are needing assistance with any of that, we submit these cases all of the time with borrowers, uh, and we're happy to help you. All right, let's see. I'm gonna to try to see if I missed some other questions that came through here. Okay, someone asked if you need 120 payments for, for public service loan forgiveness, and there were 43 given over COVID, uh, then we really only need to make 77 payments, correct? The answer is yes, uh, again, assuming that while making those payments, you're working for a qualifying employer, right? And during the 43 you know, months of payment pause during COVID, you were working for a qualifying employer, right? You need to have those conditions satisfied in order to have them count as a qualifying payment. All right, someone else asked, are there any coupon codes for signing up for Savvy? Yes, Kamani. So look right here on the screen that you see, if you go to your Savvy, from your Savvy dashboard, on the left side, it says invite friends or family. If you enter in three email addresses, okay, uh, they don't have to do anything, right? Uh, but if you enter in three email addresses, you will receive a 50% off coupon code in your inbox right away. And you can use that uh, towards the essential plan. So instead of $50 a year, $25 a year. All right. And I just want to, again, put this out there. Uh, you know, I'm happy to host a webinar uh, just like this one uh, for, you know, your local and your fellow union members. Uh, you can scan the QR code on the screen right here, or I'll put this link again in the chat. Um, and we are happy to find a time that works best for your local 
Uh, you can request it, you know, three or four questions, just asking your name and contact info. Um, and we'll reach out to try to set something up. Again, our goal is really to try and help every single union member with their student loan debt, uh, especially before the end of this month, September 30th, right with the end of this on-ramp. Many borrowers are unaware uh, and come October, if they miss those payments are gonna start going into delinquency and default. And so, uh, you know, we wanna try to help as many people as possible. So uh, I do these, I do multiple of these a day. You know, we can do them in the evening, during the daytime. Um, but I know that sometimes it's really great when you can get, you know, your local, your fellow union members together um, and tackling your student loan debt, um, you know, as a family. So, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out. We're happy to set something up. All right. Any other questions? I hope I got to as many, if not all of them, but if I, if I missed one and you're still on and, and need an answer, uh, please feel free. If you don't mind just putting it again in the, in the chat, let's see. Uh, okay. Someone asked if you already signed up for savvy and paid for savvy and then got the discount code after, how do we apply it? Quinn, if you want to just send a message, uh, from your savvy account, if you go to click contact support, just send a quick message, just saying exactly that, you know, I have this coupon code, you know, but I already paid, um, and our support team will be able to, uh, to refund you that. And then we'll, we'll sort of instruct you on how to use that coupon code to qualify for the, the discounted rate. So if you wouldn't mind, just send a quick note, just with what you, you said in the Q and a, um, through your savvy account, uh, click contact support, and they'll be able to, to get that sorted out for you. All right, someone else asked, are there any medical exemptions towards loan forgiveness? So there are not medical exemptions. Uh, well, I should say this. There is a program called Total and Permanent Disability Discharge. Uh, and give me one second. I will, uh, putting this in the chat, Total and Permanent Disability Discharge. And through this program, if, if you Google it, it'll, it'll come up with an explanation on studentaid.gov. Uh, through this program, if you are, you can either qualify through, I believe, um, uh, being a mil military veteran status and or, um, or disability through, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, but you can also qualify via doctor's note if you are deemed, you know, to have a total or permanent disability you can actually qualify to have your loans discharged um, as a result of that. So there's sort of a, it's a detailed program, but that is one option. Um, there is also a certain status of forbearance slash deferment uh, if you've been diagnosed with cancer, but that will not forgive your debt. But total and permanent disability discharge is sort of the one program in which, uh, you know, as far as medical condition, goes, you could have your loans discharged. All right. Any other questions before we wrap things up here? I appreciate everyone for, for sticking around and I really, really hope that this was helpful. Um, again, you know, would love to, to host something for, for your locals. So, uh, feel free to submit a request, uh, and we'll, we'll reach out. Um, you know, great thing to try and help your fellow union members with their student loans. Uh, we had, I think over 800 people registered for tonight. 
uh, but a smaller group on. So I know a lot of people missed out on this information. So again, you know, we're trying to just reach any and all union members uh, to, to try to help them, especially before September 30th. Uh, don't forget, you can invite your friends and family through that Savvy account um, and be on the lookout. We're going to be doing, uh, you know, a lot more of these coming up and we have, you know, webinars for any and all Savvy users on a weekly basis. You can see and access those from your Savvy account as well. Um, but I really hope that this was helpful. I know it's been a, a lot of information uh, to consume in one sitting, uh, but uh we're here to help you with anything and everything student debt related. So, you know, please feel free to reach out. And I don't think I see any more questions coming through. So um, again, appreciate you all and, and look forward to, to helping everyone with their student loans. Hope everyone has a great rest of the evening.